2020, if you just had like a million dollars in the bank, which is the startup that you would go invest in right now? That was a great video company for I've heard it's on the way out. <laughs> Hello guys and welcome to another episode of Founder Ground. This time Udit, not Richard, it's Minank who's handling the Founder Ground series where we're going to interview the best of the entrepreneurs that come on Pitch Ground to pitch their products. And today we have entrepreneur John Rankin with us who is the founder of WeWorks. John, I'm really excited to have you on the show. Good to be with you again Minank. Yes, so I'm really excited. Can you tell us how you found PitchGround and uh, like what made you come to PitchGround? Actually, we were looking, uh, we've been running for a few years now and uh, looking to um, access a lot of um, founders uh, or uh, growth hackers, uh, agencies and marketers. And uh, we'd scaled around uh, maybe five or six different uh, software pr uh, promotion platforms. Um, found you guys, uh, started talking to a few, few of your team and liked the way you were doing things. Saw a lot of your video content as well, um, at an at a edge of humor to it, which I think is uh, uh, great in, uh, in our world of video. So uh, yeah, I think uh, we're looking forward to you. had a, a big face. I quite like the 12,000 on Facebook as well. That was nice. <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, can you tell us, uh, the viewers, about yourself? because you are a serial entrepreneur with multiple startups before and people would love to know about your experiences in the past. So can you tell us how you started with this online marketing in general? Yeah, you think I'd had enough of it by now. I think every time my, uh, uh, a startup gets acquired, I always tell myself, uh, now go and get that big job and relax and let somebody else take uh, the helm. But uh, every time, it doesn't last long before you're back on. Um, to answer your question about digital marketing, I mean, I've been um, at the, I guess, the forefront of um, technology. I'm kind of mid 40s now, so I'm getting pretty old. But uh, I, uh, I came out of my postgraduate um, to run uh, call centers, 5,000 seat call centers for a home shopping uh, prior to anyone really having the internet. And uh, as part of that, uh, launched uh, um, we, the company I was working for, bought Argos, which is a big UK home shopping brand and the first to go online uh, with their catalog. Um, turned out it's a little bit too early. Uh, in order for people to buy stuff online, they first need a computer, and that wasn't the case in 1997. Um, 1997. 1997. That's when I was born. <laughs> ah, there you go. That, that was my first year out of uni. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it, it was amazing to see the first uh, uh, e-commerce um, uh, experience uh, online. It took a while for it to grow, but now it's one of the biggest e-commerce resellers. Um, same thing true, left there and joined Vodafone to launch uh, prepaid mobile phones. Um, so the, uh, again, the launch of uh, really the, the majority of mobile phones out there in the market are prepay. Um, and uh, that was what got me into marketing really before the internet um, and uh, proper. Um, I did launch the internet on mobile phones in, uh, in the UK and Europe actually, but on a weird platform called GPRS, which uh, <laughs> really was green screen and nah, you, it's not the user experience you would like. And I'm a 90s kid, so I've experienced GPRS, oh. 2G and all that. Okay, wow. All right. I and thought those dial-up connections. Yes, 56 uh, gig dial-up. Amazing. You, I mean, people are impatient now, uh, but I'm sure... I mean, there was like a time where the dial-up connection was a thing and you need to wait hours to browse a website, I believe. Oh, you could go make your dinner and come back, uh, eat it and come back and it still wouldn't have loaded. Uh, that's for sure. <laughs> it's true. And you're marketing from that era, which is, oh my God, hard to well, imagine for me as a person who was, I was just born that time. Anyway. Well, what we had to do was SMS, actually. That was the big thing back then for uh, Vodafone was uh, uh, looking at groups based on their uh, SMS activity and their friends. Again, this is really before data protection came in as well. So you were able to do a lot. Uh, and technology usually um, uh, precedes legislation uh, by quite some time. Uh, it takes quite for governments to catch up with uh, how fast, you know, the, the likes of uh, your, your customers and uh, we travel uh, through uh, technology. So that got me into marketing and mobile marketing specifically. Um, 
and, and ended up launching um, uh, new and innovative creative units um, for um, addressing audiences uh, in apps, uh, which was really my, my kind of first uh, startup experience with, uh, with the, the mobile advertising platform Smarto uh, from Germany. And uh, um, as we all know the majority of gamers out there in, uh, in the world are, are, are based in apps. That's the volume of audience. If you're going to have a marketing product, you should probably have it in there. Um, but it's still a work in progress. We've been doing that for over 10, 12 years now. And uh, um, still brands are trying to find uh, uh, their feet and decide whether or not to address an audience in a mobile app. But there we are. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And um, how was it like, you know, formulating your first startup, you know, because starting up is not at all easy. It's starting your own business, your own company. It must have been like a really daunting experience, I believe. Yeah. So the first two startups, um, uh, luckily, um, I was found as the, uh, as the second guy. And so um, a lot of that um, fundraising um, uh, round has already been uh, done, at least the initial bit. Um, they really needed somebody to come in and uh, manage the people and the customers and what would this product look like uh, and build it from there uh, and make it a reality. So up until ViewWorks, actually, um, I was usually second man in, um, the, uh, which is okay. Um, uh, this time, um, actually, uh, was, was much, much different. Um, uh, my co-founder, uh, Chris Gale, is uh, we've known each other for over 11 years. Um, actually, we had uh, startups and companies together. We used to trade with each other. Um, so it was, it, was, it was a much easier experience this time to find uh, a co-founder. But uh, in terms of funding, yeah, it's, um, uh, we've learned a hell of a lot. And I guess we've, we've been working between San Francisco, New York, London, and, uh, and Singapore, and everywhere in between. Um, and uh, you, you, you meet a lot of people. Um, so I guess... This time it was less daunting. We knew much, many more people. Um, we were selling to the same people uh, to a segment uh, that we'd already been selling to for the last 10, 15 years anyway. Um, so there was a lot of trust um, in, uh, in, in Chris and I uh, in the market. Uh, but it is new. Um, and it's a new way of doing things. Indeed. Like once you get the hang of it, I guess it becomes easier as you progress by. The, uh, yeah, to, to, to a degree. I guess uh, when most people start out, they're, they're looking to pitch um, to VCs or individuals and uh, they don't have a customer yet. They haven't kind of proved that uh, it's something that somebody wants to buy. There's no metrics for anybody to work off. Um, so really, the first money going in is uh, that all they're looking at is you. Um, and do they trust you um, if you need that money? So. We, we talked to a lot of, uh, we looked ahead and we said, look, what do the growth funds want? What does Series A want? Um, and we were told, no matter what country we went to, that we want bootstrapped. Uh, we want most of the equity to still remain in the hands of the founders. Um, we want a, a, a monthly recurring revenue, predictable revenues. Um, so that's what we kind of set out to do. Um, and uh, uh, it let what they told us was if, if they find in uh, two, three years time that uh, all the equity is gone, how on earth are they going to give you 20 million to grow when they, you've, uh, you've already given it all away at a much lower valuation so they can't come in. So we've been pretty strict um, with that and keeping the equity in place, which is nice. Um, and it's allowed us a, a, a kind of a longer runway to develop um, the product with our current customers. So it, it's morphed a lot over the last couple of years. And I think if the founders have more equity, they have more power over their product and how it's developed and how the marketing is done, et cetera, I believe. The, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, we also wanted, um, when we chose initial investors, uh, we made a rule that uh, each investor must be able to bring uh, value, usually customers um, and introductions to the company. We didn't just want to take money from somebody that didn't understand the market or our customers. Um, so and they, they've been fantastic, actually, but very passive. Um, but when we push them to, to help us in, uh, in various verticals and countries, they've been there for us. But keeping it quite small, you can five, six that could make a difference to your business um, alongside you is really, really important. True, true. You know, when people start uh, doing businesses, 
it, they have no idea what to what happens further and what comes in this journey because this is a tough journey the entre entrepreneurship and how was it like to talk to your very first customer do you remember that conversation well we actually built this for ourselves um, because our, our first customer was really us we uh, <laughs> we, we we needed We've been in video for a long time and uh, we've been advertising or marketing for a very long time, 20, 23 years. Um, uh, and we saw the emergence of video as the primary source of uh, educating customers. And when we talk about marketing and sales funnels, the, the more you can move a customer through that funnel to the point of, uh, of final closing, the better. And video is m brilliant in uh, doing the heavy lifting uh, in the, in the uh, middle that funnel. So and all brands know that it's the, the biggest spend in all digital now uh, is on video. Um, what we've always found was a massive problem was that uh, um, when you go and ask your uh, boss for money to go spend on advertising, you've got to prove that it works. And there's a big gap in just getting a view. Um, and then Absolutely. a customer popping up somewhere, there's, you know, there's a big cloudy bit that nobody can really prove um, and and that's really what we wanted to do um, we wanted to move what is ostensibly being a brand awareness uh, platform in video uh, to one that can uh, move into the performance uh, market and I, and I, I think actually COVID-19 and um, uh, companies really uh, focusing on the bottom line now um, has, uh, has made them think about performance and ROI and proving those metrics. So getting leads from videos um, is, is really what we wanted to do. Know who, you, you can't sell to anyone if you don't know who they are. That was our bottom line. True, because video marketing is really a thing in 2020 and beyond because everyone's like resorting to come to videos, show their face. I think it actually builds more trust in terms of businesses doing business because you're out there talking to the founder just like us where yeah. you're here explaining us how about your journey etc what do you think is the future of video marketing do you think is it going to evolve in any different manner well each brand's going to set its own tone of voice um and um and, and i think most brands out there when i when i look at uh, uh, platforms like youtube are doing a pretty good job and there's some great videos We've got some on our sites that I kind of review all the time. Um, my problem is that with so many videos out there, um, no matter how good the production quality is, the number of superstars you get involved, um, even if it's very real and it's, uh, it's customers doing it themselves and it's, it's, it's less produced, um, that appeals to audiences and brands know where they should be uh, in, in that tone of voice already. Um, but with billions of videos being produced um, every year. How do you get your scene? You know, and I see some really big brands out there and I, the, the video has been out for months and it's had like a thousand views. And you're thinking, wow, that, that probably costs like 30 grand, 50 grand, uh, plus sponsorship of a few million uh, of oh a footballer, God. you know, to, to, to get done. And I'm not too sure that backs out uh, on, a, on a ROI basis. So again, we talked to some of these brands about um, making sure that you get the cut through. Um, and uh, um, uh, we talk about value exchange all the time. So the IAB put out a great um, uh, article around uh, value exchange and started with millennials, but I think for sure Gen Z and beyond. Um, don't expect people just to engage with your brand um, uh, because it's a nice piece of content. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, I mean, people expect now some form of value exchange for their time and particularly Ooh. their data. So that's, that's kind of how we, we attack it. So I think not just video marketing, but any type of marketing is going to move to more uh, value exchange where um, brands are saying thank you uh, for your time, spending much longer with us, learning about what we do um, and the, the great things about our products and services. Um, and by leaving your data, we realize it's a valuable thing. You're not just going to give it out to everybody. So here's a thank you for doing that. Especially in today's times where data privacy is actually gaining a lot of traction everywhere and everyone's being extremely serious about their data and all that stuff. I think this is very important, like value exchange, like, and that's what would make companies stand out other than the companies who won't get into this value exchange train early, you know? 
and you've been a startup founder serial entrepreneur and what was it like you know transitioning from one startup to another startup right? wow well, yeah i think i said it at the start like how was the transition that. phase like it, it, i i'm sure it must be really tough daunting and again because you have to give a, give it a lot of time an entire new product etc yeah i mean as i mentioned at the start of our conversation um, every time you go through the process and it's exhausting um because uh, no matter how much you plan you don't really know what the next few months are ahead in in a startup even after 2 3 4 5 years of operation necessarily <laughs> um a bit more predictable um but every time the an acquisition happens i always think well great let's let's go into a big company uh and uh somebody else is going to look after all this other stuff and you'll just do a really good job in uh marketing or in sales or something like that and that usually lasts a few months and there's another knock on the door <laughs> and uh, got another idea or or maybe you, you you're traveling around and uh, you you and I have a a a beer or a coffee um and uh, you have a, a good idea um and then the cogs start whirring again you think well yeah actually that is a real problem and i think most of these ideas generate from coffee shops and uh, udit was also telling about how he generated the idea of pitchgar in a coffee shop by drinking a lot of coffee and yeah, <laughs> you wonder that set the tone of the video is moving forward huh yes <laughs> <laughs> caffeine enhanced yes you like drinking coffee Yeah. Well, I've had to give it up. It's uh, <laughs> I, I'm actually a, a coffee snob, um, but working from home for so often, having a, a barista coffee in your house, every call you have, you press coffee. Uh, so uh, I'm on a coffee break right now. Ah, <laughs> uh, I mean that must have been like a different this is shift altogether, you know, because people swear by coffee. Like coffee is the day I'm coffee is the first drink I'm going to start my day with, and it's the last drink before I sleep. and entrepreneurs and coffee have a special relationship i believe uh, yeah i think so i've got a 3 year old as well so i don't have any problem getting up on <laughs> i can imagine i can only imagine and since you have uh, had experiences with these many startups and raising funds etc what was it like hiring the right people to your team hiring the right team because because there's only one thing that you can do it alone and if you have the right team and you have the right hands to help with you and it gets the work done much faster right so what do you think about hiring the right team and how did you hire your first team members out there yeah i think using your network is super important because uh, uh first hand recommendations um are by far the uh, the safest way um of hiring people um, but without that you're going to make probably 50% of your hires are going to be uh, um a pain at best uh and maybe detrimental to your business um at worst uh but um the if you think about the 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 size of startup teams they're pretty small so almost everybody even the technology team ends up being customer facing and you've got to think that all of those individuals um are the company brand um and that piece is probably the most important um and been doing this for uh, almost 15 years the it it's you feel sick in your stomach when you see the conversation uh that is completely not customer friendly uh and uh, you get it in big companies as well right but uh, i think it's it's just more uh, obvious when it's a smaller uh, organization you're trying to build a relationship with your first customers uh, and a real sense of trust um that you've got to think um that every single member of staff is a potential window directly into your organization true and i'm sure you must have had the experiences of firing people with the very first time and that wouldn't have been a pleasant experience to telling people letting people go <laughs> this sounds like an interview i had uh, 20 years ago for a job um <laughs> <laughs> It, well no i mean and actually sometimes it's just a bad fit and i guess that's what you've got to consider when you're uh, they're not um uh, useless people um they're just for the, the the task that you need them for um it just might not be that suitable you've also got to um uh, admit from a founder's point of view and this is very very common um 
don't necessarily always just blame the employee. The sales aren't coming in, might not actually be their fault. You might think that maybe it's the, the, the product. Uh, and I think that happens all too often where founders think, well, I've got a great product, but the sales guys are just awful. They're just not uh, able to bring mm -hmm. it in. And I'm like, well, he's been selling millions in the other company that he, <laughs> he's just come from. So maybe it's not their, their fault. But I think that, that happens all too often, but it's a good opportunity at, at that point to, uh, to recheck uh, the, the, the product fit and the market fit for your, uh, your customer base. True, true. If you see it from an investor perspective right now in 2020, if you just had like a million dollars in the bank, which is the startup that you would go invest in right now? That was a great video company called Viewworks. I've heard it's uh, on the way out. <laughs> we were. Do you know what? I, I, I think everything's changed in the last four months um, and um, remote working technologies um, clearly is a thing that is dear to my heart because we're, we're one of them. Um, but as a, a, a business automation um, software uh, that we use, that, that Viewworks is, it fits into a, a big uh, suite of products. Um, and I know you talking to Udit um, that you guys have seen a big uplift um, since the, uh, the pandemic of people searching out for good quality, um, we do, we're on it now, aren't we? Good quality microphones, uh, software behind the cameras, Absolutely. recording equipment, uh, we, we're doing it right now. So I would, I would look to see, uh, pick a, uh, a use case, um, and it might be uh, small teams, 10, 10 people, small teams based in different geographies, which again is Viewworks, it is Bitchgram. Um, and Two what global companies collaborating together. <laughs> there you go. And, and what tools um, are they going to need as individuals, whether it's HR systems, um, loyalty systems, CRM systems, uh, software um, to run their businesses? And I, would, I, would, I wouldn't back just one, uh, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> and if you really like something, <laughs> there's five guys in the market, back, back all of them. Uh, <laughs> I think JP Morgan did that with, uh, uh, with electricity, actually. He, I think he backed uh, um, all of the uh, technologies. Um, and there we go. So quite, quite a big name in finance, I understand now. <laughs> yeah. So because I've tried VWorks too, and it's like a game changer when it comes to video marketing, I believe, because the value exchange concept, which you talked about earlier, it's happening in real time with a YouTube video. It's not yeah. like you have to make a separate video or you need a domain name, nothing else. Everything is offered by VWorks. And I think that's like a great value exchange in terms of value exchange, I think that's like a great opportunity for content creators and companies all together. So when it comes to entrepreneurship, what do you think is the number one quality that an entrepreneur should have? You know, I think, I think you would look uh, for your co-founder to have that quality as well. But according to you, what's like the number one quality or trait an entrepreneur in today's times should be having? Actually, I would advise uh, your co-founder to have a different set of skills uh, than you. Okay. Um, and the reason being is that uh, you, can, you can slap each other on the back and applaud each other uh, for doing something uh, if you're the same person and it might be the wrong thing. Um, so actually in a co-founder situation, I would suggest you find somebody that will question you all the time uh, and, and think in a completely different way. I've absolutely seen that because... Because as a founder, one founder is, can, is like really good in marketing. Other founder is really good in other aspects of uh, managing the company, like accounts, et cetera, you know? Yeah. But in terms of general entrepreneurship, let's leave the co-founder aside. But in terms of general entrepreneurship, if you were to like invest in a company or something, you would definitely see the entrepreneur, right? What is the number one quality or trait in an entrepreneur should have in today's times? I would look to somebody that really understands people because... Um, uh, Obviously, they're going to they're going to buy it, um, but it's the, the psychology behind um, in individuals and groups. Um, that kind of insight um, generally marks the guys that are going to make a couple million versus billions. Uh, I would think, um, and you've got to um, most of the, the, the big entrepreneurs, uh, get some jobs. Um, most of their ideas were, were ridiculed early on. Uh, but decades, decades on, um, they've understood where um, uh, society is going and where processes um, to automate human lives um, are going. So, yeah, some of them, you might not believe them necessarily, but I think uh, 
it's, it's understanding where, where humans are, are gonna go um, and they're uh, automating their daily lives is, uh, is, 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 is the, I guess what I would look for. Yes. And um, how did this idea of VWorks actually come into your mind? You know, you said uh, you talked about meeting new people after a few months, usually it takes a few months for the transition. But how did this idea of VWorks coming, came into your mind, like giving a perk to a person who's watching the video, you know? It's like a pretty innovative idea if I look at them in terms of video marketing. Kind of, it's actually a little step change. So my um, second uh, company, um, B7, um, was actually a rewarded video uh, platform in mobile games. Um, and it was, um, I co-founded it with a, a guy called Sam O'Login, who's founder of Talking Tom. Uh, Talking oh, Tom. Wow. Um, and uh, so it was part of the same uh, group of business. And uh, which gave us a, about 400 million um, uh, monthly active users to play with, uh, which is pretty good uh, to start off. Pretty impressive, I would say. 400 million is not a small number. All right, yeah. Um, and an established way of monetizing mobile games is rewarded video. Um, and in mobile games, um, uh, a viewer would watch a video. Um, oh, yes, I've done. I've done you've that. probably done it quite often, yeah, like billions before you. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and this is a, a billion dollar industry already, so it's, uh, it, it, it already exists. But in, in, uh, in the relationship, you've got a brand, and you've got a mobile game publisher, and you've got a, a, a viewer, an audience. Um, and in mobile games, it really works that the brand advertiser um, is another game, because you're in a game, it's very likely that you'll probably pay another one, which is cool. Um, but the reward doesn't come from the advertiser, it actually comes from the publisher. So it's a few gems or a big sword in the game you're playing, not in the advertisers uh, game. And that's fine. And actually the ratio of conversion rates um, uh, for other developers advertising within another game works really well. Um, hence they pay billions to do it. <laughs> but there was always a massive problem and, and this is what B7 did. So B7 was a rewarded video uh, in-game solution. Um, uh, uniquely, what we were trying to do was uh, allow you to earn coins in one game, go spend them in another one. Uh, so oh. to build up a really big network um, uh, and we had lots of games and we tested it and it worked really, really well. Um, made retention amazing. Um, but the problem with that was that encouraging brands into that environment was really tricky because quite rightly, the advertiser um, said, well, hold on, the, the emotional relationship, even though I'm paying for it, exists not with me and the audience, it exists between this game developer and the audience. So it's kind of incentivized, it doesn't make any sense. So um, that was one objection. Um, and the other objection was they didn't necessarily think that mobile games was that premium in terms of an environment. And you can argue that all day long. Um, which year are we talking about? Which? Which year are we talking about where mobile oh, games now. weren't actually a premium, you know? The, well, exactly, right. And, and we had these arguments over and over again with, with brands and uh, they're starting to uh, come in over the last few years, but still the majority of revenue generated from mobile games, uh, rewarded video, uh, comes from other, other games. So I, I thought, oh, well, look, if this business is worth billions um, and it works, how about if we just take it out uh, of a strictly mobile game um, environment and say, look, your objection was where it ran. So let's take that off the table straight away. Let's be agnostic and make sure that it could run uh, with your existing player, with YouTube, with Vimeo, any player that you, you wanted to use. Um, you didn't need to change that. Um, it could also run in any publisher environment. It could run on Facebook, it could run in Twitter, LinkedIn, these kind of things. So all of your uh, videos and your, your preferred publishing routes exist today. We'll just make them better, 300 times better. Um, we'll get you more views. The other thing we wanted to fix was, um, if you're gonna say thank you to somebody, um, to ensure that they're actually interested in you as an advertiser, that really should come from you, not from a third party. Um, so most brands, B2C or B2B, uh, always run special offers, promotions, discounts, value-added services, competitions, every one of them. What they don't do, including you guys, yeah, including yeah. us. Um, and yeah, in fact, your whole business is, is exactly that. Um, and, um, the, uh, if, if, you, if you're going to uh, do all of these things, that then ensures that the relationship is between you and the audience and not some random third party. 
Um, and that's great. And it allows you to build up a, a verified opt-in first-party database um, for your own um, and, uh, and, and close leads uh, directly from your existing activity. That's true. That's true. And um, what is your favorite aspect of being an entrepreneur? <laughs> Um, it's also the worst, I guess it's also the worst thing, isn't it? It's uh, the, the, the flexibility um, uh, to set your own agenda seems like the, the one um, aspect that uh, is, the, is the best thing. But actually, then I'm, then I'm going to modify the question into favorite aspect and the least favorite aspect of being an entrepreneur. Because you did, now that you said it. Well, I, well, I think it's the same answer because uh, the, the flexibility uh, you think that you get from being an entrepreneur, but actually, uh, everyone's got a boss, uh, whether it's your paying customers or your investors or your suppliers uh, or your partners, it doesn't go away. Uh, you, you <laughs> the flexibility actually doesn't really exist if your customers need you at San Francisco time and you're based in London. Well, there you are. Um, so yeah, I think the flexibility and then that's also the worst thing. Um, once you're in a bigger company, you can, uh, sh you can shoulder uh, and delegate a lot of the activities to, uh, to other individuals, but uh, equally you lose a lot of the control as well. That's absolutely true, you know? And if you, if you come in terms of entrepreneurship, what is the number one piece of advice that you would love to give a SaaS founder in today's times? What would you tell him to do? And to modify it, what would you tell him not to do as well? Um, I think uh, for any SaaS founders particularly, but this, this proves true in any technology, um, to be honest, a lot of, don't do too much development work and spend too much money uh, before you've gone out uh, and proved that uh, uh, your, uh, your concept works. Um, so there's some really good story. We didn't do this very well this time, actually. It took us... Uh, many more dollars than it should have done to, to get us to this point, but that, that's okay. Um, even though we told ourselves two years ago that we will definitely not do this. Um, but there's some really good examples where um, you can build um, online presence um, very swiftly with different messaging, uh, targeting different um, audience uh, verticals, uh, maybe four or five. Start spending a few hundred dollars on advertising and see what kind of stuff you get back. Um, and from bingo talk to those people, uh, and find out really, okay, what attracted them in. Um, now, you don't even have to have a product at this phase. It really is just a, a case of- uh, <laughs> That's an interesting market. hack. If SaaS founders were watching this, please listen to this carefully. <laughs> we should have done more of this and I wish we, wish we really had. And uh, I would have got to the, the answer a lot quicker. Um, but I've seen, I've, there's some great, great uh, examples online where people have successfully done this. And at which point, you know, um, you can extrapolate those uh, from one vertical that worked much better as a, as a concept and a, as, a, as a messaging. Um, you can extrapolate those figures to see what the true uh, volume of your uh, potential customers would be um, and the value per transaction. Um, uh, for SaaS, those value per transactions do need to be quite high actually, otherwise it does limit um, the, uh, uh, your methods by which you can use sale, uh, sales um, uh, versus just online um, clicks and things like that. So yeah, te market test first, number of verticals, don't spend very much money, then hire the team. <laughs> we hope you heard that SaaS founders who are watching this interview. Anyway, John, here comes the most interesting question of them all. And Udit would actually ask all of his founders and I'm going to do that same. Since all of the people who invest in LTDs can be called as early stage mini investors, and what I want you to do is give you a 90 second time window, just 90 seconds to pitch them about what is VVOX, why they should be getting VVOX. It's like an elevator pitch, but you only have 90 seconds. I'm going to turn on the timer. I'm going to see how you're going to do that. <laughs> and let's do it. Three, two, one, let's begin. Okay. Look. All companies, B2B or B2C, know for a fact that the best way to educate and sell your products and services is via, is via video. It's why we create all the content. If, if you're not producing video content right now, <laughs> get on the wagon pretty quickly, otherwise uh, you, you're gonna die out. But the volume of videos are out there. The problem is there's just too many. How do you get cut through? Um, and how do you sell to people? No business is in market not to sell. The, uh, 
the, we've talked about earlier that the IAB have put out some research saying 75% of all consumers want to learn about your products and services via video. They also want to be uh, receive some thank you in exchange for their time uh, and their data. Um, put those two things together, it's a win-win situation. Run your existing video campaigns, get 300% uplift by offering a thank you uh, and engagement with the audience. Um, get that data from the users, get it into your CRM system, start building those sales funnels and driving real sales for your business from, from all of your video activity. And that's why you would use video works. Awesome. It was 65 yeah. seconds and Man, you were, just... wow, it was impressive in just 65 seconds. You still have 25 seconds left, by the way. We, we can talk it. Yeah, yeah. yeah we can if you want to add anything, you can. Yeah. I think we'll, we'll, we'll stick there with lead generation from video and sales, I think is the key messages. Absolutely, absolutely. And now I want you to be really quick because we are moving on to the rapid fire round. Oh, wow. And we have some questions and ideally we want as, uh, your answers to be as short as possible. Are you ready for it, John? Okay, we're talking single, single, single words. Single words are maybe as short as possible. Okay. Got it. So the first question is, what do you consider to be the biggest win so far that matters to you? Personally, what matters to you, the biggest win that you consider? In my life? <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> That was, that sums up a lot of stuff. Interesting. Unexpected answer. Uh, you, the viewers wouldn't have expected this one, but yeah. Moving on to the next question. Tea or coffee? Tea, uh, tea now. <laughs> you talked about it. We uh, have talked about that, yeah. I'm a coffee lover. But you had to leave certain things. Tea now. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite city? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, because you stay in London, so I have to ask you this. Yeah. Um, I, do you know, I don't have a favorite city. It's got to be. It's got to be around about ten million plus people. Then there's enough to do. So any city with ten million plus, I'm happy. Loads of things to do. I mean, you must have visited uh, different places across the world. So I yeah. think you must have found like a perfect city, or which you really loved. You know. No, I think they, they, they've all got something, all things great. And then one, one thing uh, a little bit quirky <laughs> that I'd love to change. <laughs> Absolutely, you know? we, We've been in Singapore, uh, in London, uh, in, uh, in Berlin, in New York, in San Francisco. These are the main places I've worked over the last uh, 15 years. And uh, yeah, lo love them all. You, you treat them as home. Um, they're very familiar um, because they all run in a very similar way. Um, but, uh, there's a, there's always one quirky bit that you think, yeah, you should probably, this, I think that's like a part of every single city out there, you know? Yeah. Right. Because if you, if I consider it from my city, it's the traffic. Ah. <laughs> so, Somebody, I sold my car recently, so, uh, I'm making my contribution to, uh, <laughs> change. all right. And how many hours do you sleep a day? Ooh, uh, about seven. I'm up at five 30 every morning, an hour before the uh, three year old. That's right now, but what about when you started it out? The, uh, yeah, it's similar, similar, maybe 6.30. It's a, I'm, I'm a morning guy, crash through a ton of stuff in the I morning. Five. I'm a morning guy too. <laughs> yeah, it's the best way. If I don't get the grind done by lunchtime, uh, I'm too tired in the afternoon. So then it's all about talking to people in the afternoon and uh, I get energized by people. Exactly, because I get that afternoon slump where you're like feeling really sleepy. I yeah. think you're tired and all that. Jeff Bezos actually believes in the same thing as well. Well, he's done okay. So awesome. <laughs> That's a good omen for you and me. <laughs> yeah, he believes in the same thing as well. You know, taking all the decisions in the morning time. All yeah. right, moving on to the next question, which is what does failure mean to you? Um, oh, look, I mean, um, Failure, we all talk about it, that we, in a, it's, it's a positive thing. And uh, um, I think you probably fail in a startup anyway, you're failing almost every day, uh, but that just gets fed back into product. Uh, so, so then you win the next day, uh, but then there's new failures the next day. So nothing's ever perfect. Um, so I, th I, think, I think that's, that's really how I see uh, failure. I guess that's a stock answer kind of as well. 
Um, I mean, if, <laughs> bankruptcy would be a, um, a quite quite annoying. But then you know, how many entrepreneurs and millionaires have sprung from uh, from that? It just yes. shows uh, strength of will. Um, so <laughs> even that is not necessarily a, a bad Especially thing. Especially Masayoshi Son from SoftBank, you know. Uh-huh. He's like there the biggest go. example. Yeah, right. Okay. So, yeah. If, <laughs> if you give up at that point, it's a failure. If you don't give up, it's a win. <laughs> if you don't give up, it's a win. All right. What do you wish you had known when you started it out? What's like the one thing which, which you wish you had known? You know, right now you gave an amazing advice to SaaS founders, but according to you, especially to you, what's the first thing, like one thing which you had known? You wish you had known. Uh, I think... I think you need to think about your grounding and have a really stable environment um, around you. Um, Because if your home life uh, is bumpy in the slightest, you don't have it really firm, um, it will be impossible for you to crank out 10, 12 hour days, um, uh, which is very required from a a startup. Um, And then then it will not be a success um, for sure. So... Yeah, a stable, a stable home life and a stable environment is the, uh, is, is the foundation of all successful uh, businesses. Interesting, because some people want to be alone and grind it out. And this is like well, I guess it's stable. I mean, being alone is stable. It means you have no other uh, distractions. <laughs> it's a bit lonely. Truly. But yeah. <laughs> Truly. And the last question, what's something which you think you have failed at? Well, I think we just discussed the, uh, the, the whole idea of failure. Um, tr- trying and, uh, and, and not, not reaching the result you thought you would reach isn't a failure. So um, I, I would say if you, you've tried millions of things and they haven't hit the objectives all the time. I mean, at Vodafone, uh, I, I worked on 500 product launches uh, over the times I was there across every single country in the world. Um, and... 95% of them didn't hit the objectives that we thought they would hit. Um, that's okay. Uh, a, a handful of those made an absolute ton of money and people are still using today. So that's just cool. part of the portfolio. So I don't, I don't see anything particularly as a failure. Got it. So guys, that's it for the interview with John Rankin. And guys, you, you have to note this down. It's not the tech or the product or any software that can help you succeed in life. It's like the person behind the product, their experience, this knowledge that actually translates into the product. And that's what exactly happened with John, whose hard work and his knowledge just translated into VWorks because it was uh, like a mobile game uh, advertising platform before, right? And now it has become into a thing that actually companies and many creators can use in terms of value exchange to the audience that can, they can give. So, and I would like to thank you again, John, for giving PitchGround an opportunity to help WeWorks come on our ground. And I'm sure people would love this. Guys, if you're watching this video, WeWorks is already live on our platform. I've tested it myself. It hardly takes five minutes to make a campaign and we would love it if you can go to WeWorks and check it out. It's pitchground.com slash product slash VWorks. All the links will be given in the description based on YouTube or Spotify, wherever you're hearing this. And you've heard his pitch and now it's up to you to decide to try out the product and give the feedback. That is what all SaaS founders want and it's what community at Pitchground does. Thank you so much for joining to this interview. It was lovely, John. And thank you so much, all the guys. Thank you.